poll showed that 18 to 29 year old voters would be 15 percent of the vote. I personally thought that was a pretty good guess based on what we were seeing. It was higher in 12 than it was in 8. Now, just for the sake of clarification and accuracy, they voted for Obama in lower numbers. He got, depending upon which poll you look at, 67, 68 percent of that vote four years ago. He only got 60 this time. But that's a little higher than where he was polling. He was polling in the mid-50s for the most part. So very impressive achievement for Obama. Um, what I think the Republicans have to do, and by the way, he lost independence. He lost independence by six points. That's a 14-point swing from uh, four years ago. There are not a lot of people who would have guessed that you'd split the Catholic vote, lose, lose white Catholics by 10, and lose independence and still win. But again, because of this coalition that, that Stan was mentioning, he, he was able to eke out a victory. But this was a victory in a status quo election where the Republicans kept the House, Democrats keep the Senate, Republicans maintain their advantages in state houses and state legislatures, uh, that I don't think really translates into a big policy shift. What the Republicans have got to do is they've got to figure out a way to keep their small business, hunter and sportsman, uh, frequently mass attending Catholic and evangelical uh, coalition, and they've got to add to it. And the most likely place that they could add would be among Hispanics. As recently as 2004, Republicans got 44% of the Hispanic vote. They won a majority of the Hispanic vote in uh, the critical state of Florida, and they got 45% of the Hispanic vote in Ohio, and they got 16% of the African American vote in, in Ohio. So we know that it can be done. But uh, I think we thought that Obama's failure to fulfill his promise of comprehensive immigration reform would hurt him among Hispanics. It was the opposite. I mean, counterintuitively, it was brilliant not to do it. He broke a central campaign promise to one of the most important and dynamic constituencies in the electorate, but he got away with it. Why? Because by keeping it on the table, the Republicans got malpositioned as an anti-Latino border security party instead of a party that was welcoming of those voters. So it, it very much worked to his advantage. He got a higher share of that vote than he got four years ago. And my message to the Republican Party would be that if you want to be competitive in national elections, you, you better start figuring out a way to get at least 38 percent of the Hispanic vote. I, I don't know if I mentioned this or not. I'll end with this. If I did, just cut me off because I'm running on about three hours of sleep. But if you take how Ronald Reagan did in 1980 when he carried 43 out of 50 states and defeated an incumbent president by a larger margin than FDR beat Herbert Hoover. If you take those sub, how he did among those various subgroups, women, African Americans, Asians, Hispanics, 18 to 29s, and so forth, and you overlay his performance in 1980 over this electorate, he loses by the same amount that Romney did. So this is a clear long-term demographic problem for the Republican Party. The country's becoming more diverse. Uh, the country's aging. Um, and, and this is going to present some challenges for the party. I'm relatively optimistic that they can find ways to build bridges uh, to those voters, but they need to get about it, and they need to get about it right now. Ralph, you talked a lot about demographics, and we have two other panelists we haven't heard from yet, but since you're leaving early, I do want to ask, you didn't mention the issue frame of the conversation in the Christian conservative community. It does seem to me to have evolved. Can you talk about foreign policy or uh, gay individuals and how the Christian community is now, or conservative Christian community is, is looking at those issues? Yeah, I mean, we're, we're still... Uh, looking at the post-election survey that we um, commissioned, that, that we got very early this morning, about 5 a.m. But the preliminary evidence is pretty consistent with what I've seen throughout my career. You know, there's a tendency to sort of caricature and stigmatize voters of devout faith and sort of suggest that they live in trailer parks and they're poor and uneducated and easy to command and they cling to their guns and their religion and they vote on gay marriage and abortion. 
Not true. If you look at the evangelicals who voted yesterday, they voted on the economy and jobs by the exact same percentage that the entire electorate did. To put it in biblical terms, it rains on the righteous and the unrighteous alike. So evangelicals and faithful Catholics are underwater on their mortgages. They're also struggling. They're trying to figure out how they're going to send their kids to school. So they voted largely on the economy and jobs, uh, to a lesser extent on deficit and spending. You look at issues like same-sex marriage and abortion, and it's less than 10% of what drove them. I think the thing that you're alluding to, Jennifer, that has been a big change since I got involved, you know, 30 years ago with this constituency is how important foreign policy has become to them, and particularly their strong support for the state of Israel. Uh, I wouldn't say every mailing we sent out, but just about every mailing that we sent out mentioned either Obama removing Jerusalem as the capital of Israel from his platform and then belatedly reinserting it, or it mentioned his call for Israel to return to 67 borders, or it mentioned the fact that his administration had slow-walked uh, sanctions against Iran. And those issues have real resonance among uh, pro-Israel evangelicals. Jonathan Salant uh, is one of Washington's uh, most thoughtful journalists. Um, he's been covering this, uh, this sector for uh, a long time. And, and thank you, Ralph, for, for your comments. Um, he is the money and politics reporter for Bloomberg. And he's also the pr past president of the National uh, Press Club. Um, what did you see yesterday, and what does it mean for the country? Well, in 2010, we saw all this secret money in the races and the Republicans took control of the Senate and the House, and all observers said this is just going to be a, uh, f a foreshadowing of 2012. It wasn't. Obama was able to raise as much money as Romney. Romney had helped with some of the super political action committees and outside groups and the Republican National Committee, but the money was even. Obama wasn't swamped. He was able to match Romney spending dollar for dollar. The difference was Obama raised the money himself in small amounts. And Ralph, you know about how important it is to get people energized. You give a $10 to a campaign or $20 to a campaign, you'll probably give it again in a couple of months. You'll probably make a phone call. You'll probably tell your friends. And he was able to have this, like he did in 2008, this whole army of small, don small dollar donors that he could go to again and again and raised more than a third of his money from small donors. Also, by Obama raising the money himself, when you buy television time, the television stations have to give you what's called the lowest unit rate. The cheapest ad, ad rates they have goes to a candidate, doesn't go to a super PAC, doesn't go to a party. So Obama raising $500 million is worth a lot more in terms of ad time than Romney and the Republican committee and the super PACs raising $500 million. The one thing Obama couldn't do, as he did in 2008, was expand the playing field. He had raised $200, $300 million more than John McCain and could go into places like Indiana and North Carolina. This time he didn't need to do that. In fact, he could lose those two and still win with more than 300 electoral votes. But Romney, because he was able to match Obama dollar for dollar, did have the money, again with the help of the outside groups, to try to make a last-ditch effort to go to Pennsylvania Michigan, Minnesota, and expand the playing field for him. The other thing that we noticed on the money was Obama spent a lot of it early. You saw these reports, Obama is spending more money than he took in. The D Democratic National Committee had far less money in the bank than the Republican National Committee. That money had all been sent to the states much earlier. So the state parties and the fundraising, and that fundraising operation, the get out the vote operation, had months head start over the Romney campaign According to the money, Romney had a lot more money in the bank. The the, Ron, his joint fundraising committee had all this extra money in the bank. The Republican National Committee had all this money in the bank. Obama and the Democrats had already sent it out to the state committees, and they were spending it trying to get, their, get out the vote operation. And in the first panel, we had heard about the uh, one of the panelists mentioned that Karl Rove was the big loser of 2012. Uh, we have to add another name to that, Scott Reed. The U.S. Chamber of Commerce won one of about the 14 or 15 Senate races that it played in. They lost all the others. It won a second one only in the primary when Orrin Hatch was, won the primary, but it also intervened in the uh, Missouri race in the primary, and their candidate lost to Todd Aiken. So even with all that money, it didn't affect the races that the 
Democrats were, knew about this outside money, which they didn't know in 2010, and were prepared themselves. They had their own super PACs, they had their own outside groups, and they were able to win a lot of those races and basically money, they were parity. Thank you, Jonathan. I'm going to turn it over to Jim Pinkerton, who uh, served in the Reagan administration and the Bush administration. He's also a political analyst with the Fox News Channel, and he's a regular on Fox News. So what do you think happened last night, and what does it mean for America? Well, thank, thank you, Jennifer, and I apologize for being late. I was late for reasons I'll get into in a, in a moment. Uh, um, you know, look, uh, I, I worked in the political affairs office under Lynn Nosserger and Ed Rollins way back in the Stone Age, and so I could ne I could never resist sort of crunching the numbers a little bit, and I'm very sorry to have missed what uh, uh, Stan said. Uh, um, there's two ways of thinking, of interpreting, if you will, um, how President Romney did uh, versus President Obama last, last night. Um, on the one hand, it is extremely hard to defeat an elected incumbent president, okay? Uh, since 1900, uh, through 2004, 10 of 14 elected incumbent presidents were re-elected if they, if they sought re-election. 10 of 14. Now, of course, it's 11 out of 15. Uh, it, it is a daunting uh, challenge to beat somebody. The, the White House tends to turn over uh, when there's an open seat, as it were. Um, to put it another way, uh, only once since 1896 has a president and a party lost the White House after only four years. Usually, a single-term president is followed by presidents of the same party, uh, or, or succeeds them. So that was 19, that was Jimmy Carter in 1980. Uh, the Democrats came in in '76, and with, along with Carter, and the Democrats left the White House uh, along with Carter at the same time. That, so only once in 116 years has somebody uh, succeeded in doing what Governor Romney tried and, and, and failed to do last night. Uh, so in that sense, you can say, look, it was sort of more likely than not that uh, this president would, would find himself reelected. Uh, um, on the other hand, um, the Republicans have now lost four of the last six presidential elections. And if you count the popular vote, it's five of the last six. Uh, something has gone wrong there. Uh, from in the first 13 decades of the Republican Party's history, from 1860 to 1988, the Republicans uh, and, uh, won 21 out of 33, and, and, and uh, now they've lost four out of, four out of six. And that, that's a that's a just uh, something that Rep Republicans again. There'll be a lot of uh, soul searching uh, as time goes by, uh, starting today. Um, on the other hand, uh, you know, John Boehner uh, can say that uh, he won a mandate as well. Uh, any, any, any member of Congress in either party is happy to remind you that the, exec, the legislative branch is mentioned first in the Constitution, the executive branch is second. Uh, um, they're all allegedly equal, but still anybody who works in, on this Capitol Hill will tell you, no, no, look, we're first. Uh, um, and the president proposes and, and Congress disposes. And uh, you know, for some of the reasons Ralph, Ralph touched on, you know, the, uh, I'm sure the Republicans are, are feeling optimistic about the 14 midterms and, uh, you know, and so on in terms of uh, second midterm elections. Ten, not always, but ten to go well for the party out of power. Uh, um, but I think, I think the real uh, uh, takeaway is sort of the, the continuity of the concept of divided government. Uh, since, since World War II, the one party and has controlled both the White House and both houses of Congress for only 28 out, out of those 67 years. Okay, so 39 out of the 67 years since World War II, the power in this town has been divided. And so you have to conclude that there's at some level the American people uh, kind of like that because uh, uh, they, keep, they keep voting for it again and they just voted for it again uh, last night for another, at least another, another two years. Um, yeah. What is, so those are the interpretations, or at least some interpretations. Uh, as for impl implications, uh, I, can, I can sort of put them in, in three categories. Uh, one is, is issues that the, uh, the, the two parties tend to agree on, and that's a fairly small group of issues they tend to agree on. Uh, one not notable, and I, and I uh, confess that I work for the, something called the Rate Coalition, which works on this issue, is the corporate income tax. Uh, it was striking during the campaign that both in the, in the debates that both President Obama and uh, Mitt Romney agreed on lowering the corporate rate. It's the highest in the world. 
um, and to bring that down. Um, they didn't agree on every last issue concerning that, that but they certainly had the general idea and, and, in, in common. And so I think as we look to fiscal cliffs and grand bargains and so on, there is, there is some considerable grounds for optimism that a, a corporate tax uh, agreement will be in the package. Um, as, for, as for disagreements, uh, the, the one that immediately leaves to mind is energy, uh, Keystone Pipeline. Uh, I think that was, if you had to sum up you know, the Mitt Romney energy, energy agenda and the House uh, in Congressional Republican energy agenda, it begins with the K word, Keystone Pipeline, um, and we'll just see what happens uh, on that one. Uh, we've sort of got the, uh, to use the old Isaac Asimov uh, analogy, We've got the irresistible force of energy consumption in this country and the immovable object of opposition to CO2 and global warming, which obviously got a boost in the wake of Hurricane Sandy. Um, and we'll just have to see what happens. Uh, um, uh, 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 another category, though, is th things that, I'm th that didn't get talked about, and I think that's uh, 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 very unfortunate. And uh, first on that list, uh, I would talk about healthcare defined as medicine, defined as 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 curing things. Uh, we've had, f for you know, since the Clinton era, we've had abundant discussions of healthcare finance, healthcare insurance, who should get insured, who shouldn't get insured, uh, so on and so on. And during that sa the same 20-year period, the number of the quantity of medicine actually emerging from the medical scientific pipeline has. Uh, plummeted. Uh, the number of new drugs approved by the FDA is down 63% in the last 15 years. The number of new medical devices is down 40%. The number of new antibiotics is down 80%. Um, the amount of venture capital in the field is down be anywhere between one-third and three-fourths, depending on uh, which source you look to, but nobody, nobody thinks it's going up. In other words, we're in this paradoxical situation, and again, President Obama's re-election uh, will only uh, enunciate this further, we are committed to taking care of everybody in this country on their health care. The truth of the matter is we've had a sort of crude version of national health insurance since EMTALA, the Emergency Treatment and Labor Act of 1986, was signed by President Reagan, which says that you can go to an emergency room and get treated. Uh, that is not a particularly satisfactory way to do uh, health care, but it is a way, and nobody really disputes that that would ever stop happening uh, in, the in, in, in the future, no matter who had won the election last night. But again, we now have uh, 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 an enhanced and sort of, if you will, mandated in sense of an election mandate commitment to uh, if you're an American, you know, a citizen or not, you're going to get covered, you're going to get treated, you're going to get everything. And so the challenge then is how do you make it cheaper? Uh, Six million Americans in this country today have Alzheimer's, and that's a $172 billion hit on the economy, according to the Alzheimer's Association. And, and again, Jennifer, who's done great work on this, has some pieces of paper, I suppose, are outside or on your chairs, uh, which I would call your attention to on this. Uh, um, it is very hard to see how anybody, whether it's, uh, you know, the, the, the Obama administration working or not working with, you know, Paul Ryan, who will be returning to the Congress, uh, or the Gang of Six, or any, uh, Simpson Bowles, any, anybody who is uh, uh, wrestling around with these issues, uh, how you're going to make progress long term on Medicare costs with uh, Alzheimer's, which again, now 6 million people, $172 billion, uh, 30 years from now, 25 million people, and an annual cost of a trillion dollars, uh, or trillions, plural, and for a cumulative cost between now and 2050 of 20 trillion, 20 trillion with a T. Uh, that's a lot of money, and uh, all the market forces and all the empowerment and all the everythings and better management aren't going to change the fact that if people uh, are, are in a state of dementia for 20 years in a nursing home, uh, it's a very labor-intensive and very uh, costly process. And I think it's, it's very unfortunate um, that these issues did not get raised uh, during the campaign. Uh, uh, my friend Lou Weisbach, who's in the audience here, has started up a group called the American uh, Center for Cures, which has been pushing the idea that a cure is cheaper than care. It's cheaper to, uh, to beat a disease and to treat a disease. And so um, he and I met with uh, Dr. Francis Collins at the NIH this morning, and the meeting ran long because it's such a robust topic. And that's why, that's why um, I'm late, and I apologize again for that. Um, I, I do think that, uh, and maybe this is just wishful thinking on my part, but it just the, the, the 
urgency of the situation to make budget cuts that, are, that don't lead to the political destruction of the people making them. And I speak for both parties now. I mean, again, the one lesson of 2000, one lesson of 2010 is when the Republicans came out against the Affordable Care Act, uh, they had a, the Medicare uh, cuts in there, the, the, the Obama administration's Medicare cuts to the Medicare Advantage program, and they made hay out of that, um, big time. And in 2012, again, all the exit polls have to get crunched and everything, but it, it certainly seems as if the revival of that statement, that the, the so-called $716 billion cut in, in Medicare that the Affordable Care Act uh, put into place, uh, did seem to take a lot of the sting out of uh, uh, the, the Democrats' attacks on Paul Ryan and the Ryan budget and so on. So they kind of played each other to a draw. Uh, but it's sort of a strange situation now. We go into 14 where uh, we've sort of had lessons in the voters just don't like uh, Medicare cuts. Now, if the, if the Medicare cuts and changes and vouchers and what, uh, premium support, whatever you want to call it, are inevitable uh, for fiscal reasons, so be it. But then uh, that puts an enormous uh, incentive to people like Dr. Collins and, and Lou Weisbach, who can think, and Jennifer, who can think of ways to help mobilize the country on behalf of actually uh, solving some of these medical problems. Uh, you know, we, we don't spend money on polio now because we cured polio. Uh, the, the Milken Institute uh, two or three years ago revived a, a, found an old study that the government had done in 1950 in which it had projected that if present trends on polio treatment, which is to say wheelchairs and iron lungs, uh, continued through the year 2000, the cost would have been about $100 billion a year, which is greater than the federal budget. Now, of course, it's adjusted for inflation, that $100 billion is more like a trillion, <coughs> excuse me, and so uh, that would have been pretty daunting for anybody's budget balancing plan. And instead, happily, uh, in 1955, um, uh, J Dr. Jonas Salk, working in sort of a, what was effectively a public-private partnership, uh, cured polio, the disease went away, and we don't spend anything on, on, on polio anymore, at least not in this country. Uh, so that's, a, that's actually, come to think of it, as an interesting 60th anniversary that, that, that President Obama is going to uh, confront um, in his term, 2015, the 60th anniversary of the polio vaccine. And there's also one other anniversary, just while I think of it, that will also be coming up in, 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 during President Obama's second term, which is in, in November of 1944, uh, as, a, as World War II was coming to a close, President Roosevelt uh, wrote a, a letter to a fellow named Van Bush, who was the head of the R&D for the Pentagon, and said, listen, we've had this wonderful, uh, wonderful, heroic, uh, world-saving effort to uh, mobilize technology and radar, and, you know, proximity fuse, and a, a, all number of invention, synthetic rubber, and of course, the atomic bomb. And we need now to bring that same miracle of progress and sort of organized, concerted effort uh, to the civilian front, uh, including uh, medical care. And that, that document, again, it, it uh, became the sort of the founding uh, uh, agenda document for uh, the whole post-war effort of completely bipartisan, Truman, Eisenhower, and, and you know, including the Kennedy's space, Kennedy Johnson space mission, um, to put the, the curve bending from science on front and center in international policy. And I think it's been unfortunate that that scientific emphasis has fallen off of uh, the national agenda um, over the last few years. And I think we've all paid a price for it, not only in terms of our own health, but also in terms of the future cost of medical programs and healthcare programs. And now I'm optimistic uh, that uh, we can find a way to get it back on the agenda. Uh, in this in this second term, uh, I would point, for example, to uh, President Obama's science advisor, the, the PCAST, uh, uh, Council of Advisors in Science and Technology. If you look on a document that doesn't seem to have gotten any attention, but it, it did get published from the Executive Office of the President on September 25th, there's a call there for a doubling of the new medical new medical drugs and, and treatments. Doubling. Uh, I think that's a much more refreshing and, frankly, politically popular approach to take uh, as we look think about healthcare issues as opposed to budget cuts. And I hope that, uh, frankly, uh, both parties uh, take it up in the next four years. So Jim has just put a, a serious policy uh, issue on the table. Um, this is a partisan, uh, you know, <clears throat> s 
environment that we're in. We're inside the U.S. Capitol here, or steps from the Capitol here inside a committee room. There's not much that happens in Washington today because of the uh, partisan fighting. Um, is there room after this agenda where we just spent $6 billion in a campaign beating each other's <clears throat> brains out and came up with the same president, the same Congress, and the same Senate for serious bipartisan efforts <clears throat> on curing diseases like Alzheimer's or any other short of uh, Agenda, Ralph or Stan? Let me start with somebody from a partisan perspective. <laughs> <laughs> well, let me put this on my wish list. But the, I mean, part of this, and I'm sure this is going to be seen as a partisan comment. The, uh, I, I looked at Ralph, Ralph's reaction to this, um, where he said that if we look at what the the pattern of who votes in the 2010 election, if we can rep, if that is replicated in 2014, um, then we will, you know, then we can have a big pushback uh, against the Democrats. Okay. The now that's a formula because um, that's what happened in 2010. 2010 set up 2012. That is the extremism of the, of the Tea Party, the polarization set up the the 2012 election so that we have a we have a situation where the republicans have won a more the most votes in only one election since national election since 1992 they're not a viable national party they can't elect presidents of the united states if their strategy for 2014 which the you know the majority leader you know the or the Republican leader in the Senate seemed to say, then we're not going to get there, <laughs> that they're going to minimize the interpretation of this election. Now, if you focus on this election, it's a landslide battleground election. Uh, we'll soon that we have the president with the majority of the vote. And by the way, there aren't many of our presidents who've gotten a majority of the vote, including Bill Clinton. And we'll see the numbers, well, again, will go up. Um, so I think his actual overall vote will be seen as, you know, as uh, substantial. The underlying consequences of the trends, I think, are even more serious. Um, and I think it's possible that people um, and I, you know, say that indeed there needs to be some period of, um, you know, uh, in, in the lame duck and then maybe even early in the next year where Republicans learn or seem to have learned from it. It is a misreading of the Senate elections to say it's status quo. And as a misreading to say this is a non, this is a non event because incumbents always get reelected. No OECD leader across the world since the financial crisis has been reelected except Merkel. Leaders, incumbent leaders across the globe, this is a unique period, have gotten slaughtered. And it was amazing that this president got elected. And these forces that we've talked about, including the Republican brand, enabled them to win in that context. But what does that mean for policies? Uh, well, no, no, it does, no, no. What I'm saying is the question is, do they, in the days after this, say that if we're going to be a national party, that we have to think about this differently, which I think there are areas in which you could move to reach action. Because I don't, by the way, they didn't run, you know, if you look at what they did on the Ryan budget, they didn't run on the Ryan budget. They tried to muddy up Medi the, the, the health care reform by saying they want to do more Medicare cuts than us. You know, we're battling over who's the bigger Medicare cut. They didn't take the reform of entitlements and social insurance to the country. They hid from it. They ran as bipartisan. The Tea Party House members who got reelected hid from that record in order to get reelected. Reberg, who ran in, Mo in Montana for the Senate, used the fact that he was in the baby caucus with my wife, Congresswoman Ro liberal Congresswoman Rosa DeLauro, as, a, as evidence of it being bipartisan. So that the, they didn't run on the, as Tea Party Republicans seeking to get reelected. So maybe when they come back, they'll look at what happened in the Senate, which was a sweep. And they'll look at this overall election and say, we've got to do something. And so there's an opportunity on immigration reform as they start, on tax reform, you know, as a start, energy. I mean, I could put a whole series of things on the table, maybe even uh, implementation of the Affordable Care Act, that there are a whole range of things that one could do if you've made a decision that we would benefit from learning from this election. Um. I'd, I'd like to respond to that by by pointing out first of all that a lot a lot of these victorious Democratic Senate candidates ran as far from Barack Obama as it was possible to do, and still be in the same party. Today, just for fun, go, Google or go to YouTube and watch maybe the last ten Heidi Heitkamp ads in North Dakota. You know, 
for the Keystone Pipeline, for uh, increasing coal production, for drilling offshore for oil, uh, for fixing Obamacare. Uh, I mean, Joe Donnelly, okay, he beat Richard Murdoch in Indiana, but the idea that this people were voting for uh, keeping Obamacare as is and for his spending agenda, it's just not backed up by the data. I mean, Joe Donnelly is as pro-life, pro-marriage, and fiscally conservative as you can be and be a Democrat and, and, and be in the party. You look, at, uh, look at Tim Kaine, who was chairman of the DNC two years ago. He's basically running ads criticizing Barack Obama on raising taxes on small business in Virginia. So I just don't think it's going to wash to say that this is an across-the-board repudiation of where conservatives have been on public policy matters, and it is, it is ipso facto uh, a, a retention of Obama's public policy agenda. I think if you look at the exit polling, a plurality of the electorate is for repealing all or part of Obamacare. And most of the Democrats, and believe you me, I was distributing voter, voter guides in every one of these targeted races. We went to every one of their websites. We researched every one of their debates. They pretty much said, I really don't like it the way it is. I do think we need to allow children under the age of 25 to stay on their, their parents' policies, which was one of the key elements of Obamacare and we ought to keep uh, the previous condition provision. But beyond that, we gotta fix it. You know, I'm against the, the individual mandate, I'm against the, the $2,500 fines on small businesses. I mean, they, they were very critical of the program. So, you know, we'll see what happens. I, I would say, Stan, the one area where I think there will be openness, whether or not there'll be bipartisan progress, it's really hard to say, because I can't really speak to how the White House will approach this. But I think there is a strong desire to, I'm not sure I want to, you know, throw the, the red meat in the shark tank of comprehensive immigration reform, because that gets very complicated. You know, it, it includes so many things. But I think there could be progress on immigration. I think if you, if you look at what Rubio's proposed with his own version of the, the DREAM Act, you could have some hybrid of what Rubio's proposed and what Obama's proposed. With regard to your specific question, which is increased funding for research into some of these dreaded diseases, sure, I think you could have bipartisan uh, consensus on that. I think if you go back to the stem cell debate in the, in the previous decade, you know, there was a disagreement on embryonic versus adult stem cell research. We had deep and grave moral concerns about the harvesting of embryos in order to, to get those cells. I, I think, you know, we may have lost the political battle on that, but scientifically speaking, the greatest advances on stem cell research have actually taken place with adult stem cells. So if we can find those kinds of areas of agreement, I think there'll be a great amount of interest in finding some cures and some scientific breakthroughs <laughs> like Jim was talking about that, that would move us beyond just saying, you know, we're going to have to cut Medicare by you know, by $10 trillion over the next 50 years. Yeah. I'm going to let Jonathan respond, and then I'm going to let each panelist say one prediction on what they see ahead. Jonathan. Well, the question becomes, do people want to work together? And if politically, if you think you can do better by opposing everything, you'll oppose everything. And if you politically you think you can do better by working out deals the way Gingrich and the Republican-led Congress worked out deals with Bill Clinton, they'll work it out. And it's a matter of both sides being willing to come to the table and give and take. So that was very fast. <laughs> a journalist uh, version of, of what's going on. Uh, Stan, predictions? Um, I think the surprise, none of us surprise, uh, may be what happens with health care, health care reform, and the implementation of health care reform. Because we've talked about this partisan polarization as if there aren't other people involved. When you get to healthcare, there are so many people who are in, either in the process of or have to make decisions about going forward on how they implement the healthcare reform law, uh, including the insurance companies and the health exchanges and the governors, that I think that they're going to, that the interests who want to, want to proceed, whether or not they were for it or not, I think it'll be tremendous pressure to just put your head down, implement, 
change but make it uh, make it a point of progress it may be very hard to ever come back to obamacare uh, as I, it came out of this you know much more popular evenly divided in our in our polling on on uh, on obamacare uh, in the electorate that voted, um, and I think it, it'll be an issue of the past as it gets implemented. Jonathan? Well, we have a fiscal cliff that has to be addressed, or else all, all of a sudden there's $1.5 trillion in cuts in the Mets spending and defense spending, and a, the entire Bush tax cuts get uh, repealed because the bill was written that way, so they would be repealed. They can fit under federal budget laws. So the question becomes what they do about it. And they have to do something about it because or else we're going to be, A, in another recession, and B, taxes are going to go up for everybody, and nobody on either party wants to see everybody pay more in taxes. Before I go to Jim, let me tell the audience that's watching on C-SPAN that if you want to send me your predictions, just go to the website, laszlostrategies.com, and send me an email because I'm interested not just in what the pundits are saying here in Washington, but what people back home are thinking about the future and what this election means. So, Jim, you're going to get the last word. Well, thank you. Um, I, I just, in terms of what could happen in terms of consensus, I, I do agree with Ralph and I, I guess Stan also that Immigration is probably something where the, the, there's, there'll be some forward progress on. And I also agree with Stan on uh, the health insurance issue is probably somewhat played out. I was struck um, when the shootings happened in, in Aurora, Colorado over the summer. Uh, that was exactly the demographic of people who don't have health insurance, sort of uh, working, young working class kind of people. And the hospitals all immediately said, well, of course we'll cover them. We'll pay for all their bills and stuff. So you know, we'll find the money from somewhere through some mechanism, uh, come what may. We always have, or at least for, for decades now. In terms of prediction, uh, again, I'm a little bit uh, health care on the mind since I just met with Dr. Collins this morning at the NIH. Um, there's a congressman named Rob Andrews, who is a Democrat from New Jersey, who's been in 11 terms. He's a fairly senior guy uh, in, in the Democratic uh, conference, who is, had an article in the Wall Street Journal in September in which he called for an Apollo-style effort on medicine. And he said specifically, we should be focusing as a lead issue on wounded warriors and not just paying for their wheelchairs and therapy and, uh, you know, com you know uh, main maintenance for the next 60 years of their life, but also really looking at putting them back together and helping them walk and, you know, get getting their brains uh, back fully functional and so on. And uh, that's, a, to me, an unbelievably uh, poignant and powerful political uh, argument. Uh, and I think the moral conscience of the country would be awakened on that score. And so he's talking about a genuinely quantumly higher uh, effort, uh, perhaps through some innovative uh, financing uh, mechanism um, that, that will be un unveiled probably by the, by the end of this year. And it, yes, we have to deal with the fiscal cliff and so on and so on. And yes, there'll be enormous circumstances. But uh, the reality that we spend $2.6 trillion on health care in this country every year and spend about only about $100 billion of that, 4% on medical R&D, uh, again, we see the results in terms of the, the fall off in, in new treatments and cures, and I think that the chance to unite the country around some way to actually make health care cheaper, just as we made, elect made you know, electronics cheaper uh, using technology, as opposed to just uh, you know cutting here and trimming there and so on. I mean, the, the, the economist William Baumol has a new book out about healthcare and just makes the point: look, if it's labor intensive, it's expensive. Period, and it won't get cheap. And if you want to make it cheap as well as good and comprehensive, then you have to think about uh, automation and technology and IT. And I think Rob's bill will en encompass a lot of that as well. And I think it'll be quite exciting uh, come 2013. So thank you very much. I want to thank uh, all the candidates who ran for office, whether they were Democrats, Republicans, or some other political party, for being their willingness to serve this country. I want to thank uh, those who engage in voting, which is our highest civic duty uh, for doing that. Um, I want to recognize that we are at a juncture that is very difficult in this country, where 49 percent roughly voted for each uh, candidate. And so we're going to have to come together to heal. So it's great to 
start on that process by having Democrats and Republicans together on a panel to have journalists who are thinking thoughtfully about these crises. So I want to thank uh, uh, the first panel who was with us uh, today, but also want to thank Ralph Reed, who left earlier, but Jim Pinkerton and Jonathan Salant and Stan Greenberg. Thank you for what you did, not only on the panel, but for your serious thinking that you do on these topics day in and day out. So on behalf of, thank of Laszlo Strategies, thanks for coming. Here's a sampling of what C-SPAN viewers had to say about the results of the presidential election. Like you and Matt were talking about the 47% comment, I was extremely offended by that. I am 24 years old, 